Women have been consistently mistreated in film for forever. No matter the genre, female characters are misportrayed. That's probably because most women in film are created and directed by men. We rarely see a woman's life told by a woman. We see the male gaze thrust upon women characters in their physical appearance or in the conversations they have, which are usually just about men. Women are constantly showing their audiences that the, to be a powerful woman, you have to look a certain way and act in a sexual way to get what you want. Sexualization is sexualization, no matter the source. Female superheroes are a fantastic example of this. They are strong and independent, but they wear skin-tight latex that provides no protection in battle. Hilary Pennell and Elizabeth Bem Morowitz, both prolific pop culture scholars, have stated that it is the dichotomous representation of superheroines as being extraordinary, yet sexualized, that muddies the potential for these characters to be empowering. The sexualization does not stop at superheroes. Just about any female character in film serves some sexual purpose. They exist only because the male character existed first. Wes Anderson's Rushmore provides another good example. Jennifer S. Dean highlighted in her book, Secret Lessons, what we have learned from teachers on television and in the movies, that the role of Miss Cross is not to teach, but rather to create a space for the film's male characters to gather, swoon, and plot their acquisition. Did the Transformers need Megan Fox? Did she do anything other than provide morale for the strong, masculine cars so that they could save the world? I can't even think of her name off the top of my head. Laura Mulvey has not taken these blows to femininity while sitting down. She criticizes all of classic narrative cinema from the golden age of Hollywood as voyeuristic and patriarchal. This argument is evergreen, however, and can apply even today despite Hollywood's attempts at progressivism and diversity inclusion. She has fostered a form of feminist criticism that still pervades discourse today. One of her most interesting arguments is that of the female body as a phallic object. According to Mulvey, the image of the woman's body not only offers pleasure, but also poses a threat through her lack of a penis, the threat of castration. On route by which patriarchal cinema deals with this threat is that of fetishization. In order to assure uninterrupted, if not heightened, visual pleasure, the woman's body is idealized into a phallic object. This further illustrates the traditional male need to control women and their bodies. Mulvey argues that they are so threatened by the difference of the female form that they need to rationalize why they are attracted to them. Hollywood revolves around this principle of visual pleasure. The Bechtel test was invented in 1985 by Alison Bechtel. In order to pass the test, a film must have at least two female characters that have names, and they must have a conversation about something other than a man. Simple, right? WRONG! The bar is low. Incredibly low. Even if a film does pass the Bechdel test, that does not necessarily mean that there is good female representation. Let's take a look at the filmography of Wes Anderson, for example. Five and five. That's not too bad. Some would even hail Wes Anderson as a feminist hero because of this statistic, but it's still not enough. Wes Anderson's female characters thrive on a cool girl edginess that allows them to exploit their own sexuality under the guise of feminism. We think that his female archetypes are not only misrepresentations of women, but are a shoddy ploy to avoid giving his female characters more personality. Wes Anderson is widely beloved by film critics and indie kids alike. Due to his distinctive style, Wes Anderson has almost become a verb in itself. Symmetrical, brightly colored, and nostalgic are all characteristics of his style. His characters fit perfectly within his strange little world that he's created. Men are quirky yet lovable, and they go on fantastic journeys in order to find their true selves. His female characters are intelligent and aloof. They never do exactly what the male character wants them to do. They are beautiful wild cards that you can't help but want to emulate. Because of this, Anderson's cult following has adopted these women as paragons of radical femininity and open sexuality. Wes Anderson himself has said that all of his films are somewhat autobiographical, so it makes sense that the majority of his characters are male. This also explains why all of his protagonists are so similar. Because of his film's self-reflecting nature, there are relatively few female characters to analyze. There is about one per film that has a big enough role to even be talked about. Some of Anderson's most memorable women include... Anyone would describe these women as cool girls. Uninterested, outspoken, and effortlessly beautiful, Wes's women are in a league of their own, but they are not immune to Mulvey's criticisms. These characters all fit within the realm of the male gaze, which could be defined as female characters created by men for men. Laura Mulvey, the leader behind challenging the straight, misogynistic trends in cinema, outlined this idea in 1973 with an article titled Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. Her thoughts are delineated as such. Films are made for straight men to live out their fantasies through viewing sexualized female characters. Mulvey says, 
Woman then stands in patriarchal culture as signifier for the male other, bound by a symbolic order in which man can live out his fantasies and obsessions through linguistic command by imposing them on the silent image of woman, still tied to her place as bearer of meaning, not maker of meaning. Women are not individuals when they're shown on screen, but are a visual, pleasurable object serving only to arouse men and give them the sense that they control the woman on the screen. Mulva even suggests that most movies could have perfectly functioning plot lines without the existence of women at all. She exists for one of two purposes, either to alter the storyline for the man, meaning she's a distraction from the man's real mission, or she is there to be pretty and looked at as a mere ornament by both people within the film and onlookers in theaters. These feminist criticisms and Wes Anderson's lack of authentic female characters all culminate in his 2021 film, The French Dispatch. The French Dispatch seems to be the pinnacle of Wes Anderson's iconic style. It is symmetrical, witty, self-aware, and full of futura bold. It all fits the formula for a perfect Wes Anderson film. We would even dare to call it the most Wes Anderson-y Wes Anderson film of all time. So, if the trends we talked about earlier are true, then the female characters in French Dispatch must be super empowering and individualistic. Right? Ha, huh. just kidding. The female characters in this film are just like all of the others in Anderson's films. They are beautiful, one-dimensional, and aloof. Because there are so many separate stories in the French Dispatch, at least there is more than one female character to dissect. Let's start off by analyzing the first story, written by Tilda Swinton's J.K. L. Bernstein. The article recounts the beautiful, albeit slightly twisted, love story of inmate and artist Moses Rosenthaler and Simone, a guard at the Ennui prison. Moses, while serving a lengthy sentence for murder, uses Simone as the muse for one of his pieces and begins to fall in love with her. Simone naked cell block J, is the piece that ultimately gets Moses recognized as an art star. Simone, the reason that Moses becomes an artist, is first shown on screen naked, which under the circumstances is acceptable as one realizes she is posing in the nude for Moses. However, this scene sets the tone for the power dynamic between the two. Simone naked being used as an object for Moses where he can find inspiration. Mulvey would argue that she is being used as a phallic object to ensure that the male viewer's pleasure is not threatened by her cold and stern attitude. She is his muse in every sense of the word, but she's beautiful and a revelation to give Moses a reason to paint and give us our story. Their more romantic relationship is complicated by the fact that in an admission of love by Moses, Simone interrupts with a swift, I don't love you. She is portrayed as cold, emotionless, and stubborn. She is an honest and independent woman, yet still sexualized in not only her role as a model, but the dichotomy of the relationship. Simone is a guard over Moses, so she has the powerful and demanding qualities formed from her childhood, as we learned in her backstory, but that power struggle is almost fetishized by her being the naked, vulnerable one to the emotionally vulnerable Moses. Moses' work is recognized and bought by a fellow inmate who happens to be an art collector and a fan named Julian Cadazio. Once released, Julian convinces his art collecting uncles to put Moses' piece on display, causing him to become a sensation in the world of art. Three years after the piece's initial success, Cadazio, his art collecting uncles, and fans of Moses all become aggravated by the lack of art, so they demand a new piece to be made ASAP. They bribe their way to meeting with Moses in the Ennui prison, only to find a travesty, a three-piece fresco painted onto the walls of the prison, making it virtually impossible to profit off of Moses' creation. A nasty and incredibly cinematic brawl is used between Cadazio and Moses, however soon enough the hatred subsides. Cadazio appreciates the pieces for what they are and arranges to have the walls airlifted to a private museum in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. The story ends by letting the audience know that Simone soon left the prison after earning commission from the paintings, but that she and Moses still keep in contact with each other. This adds to the point that women are in the film to let the heterosexual male live out their fantasies, in this case, that of being a painter. It also confirms the statement by Mole that women are the bearers of meaning, not makers of meaning. Simone existed in the story to be symbolic through the art of Moses. She did not create anything for herself, but simply stood as the inspiration for the male protagonist. To offset her less valuable role in the story, she was made to be a stubborn, strict woman, so as to seem that she really didn't want a leading storyline anyway. This next story is written by Frances McDormand's Lucinda Kremitz. She's whip smart and a darn good journalist. She's also old and unmarried, but she prefers it that way. Her story starts when she's having dinner with some of her friends, and they try to set her up on a date, much to her dismay. She escapes to the bathroom, where she finds her friend's teenage son, Zeffirelli, sitting in the bath, writing a manifesto. He asks her to proofread it. She eventually sleeps with Zeffirelli, but it doesn't even matter to her, because she's cold, 
callous and aloof. It was his first time. One of the teenage rebels, Juliet, despises Mrs. Crimmins and does not feel that her presence is necessary for the protest. They argue, and Juliet eventually exclaims, She's in love with Zeffirelli! Exposing the root for her disdain, she has feelings for him. Mrs. Crimmins blows off the remark and shows that Zeffirelli means nothing to her. She just slept with him. The story culminates with one of the radio towers going out. The young protesters need a way to reach the outside world, so Zeffirelli climbs up to fix it. He tragically falls to his death, and Mrs. Crimmins doesn't even care. She's apathetic in her writing of the story, showing that she never had feelings for the boy. Mrs. Crimmins' character is interesting because multiple times the term old maid is thrown around by other characters in the story in relation to her. However, Mrs. Crimmins says that she prefers not to be married or have kids because it affects her writing, her job. But then in two different scenes, she's seen crying, and she says that she's lonely. Wes Anderson tries to do Mrs. Crimmins justice by having her character say that she's chosen this life of being single and is dedicated to her career, something many feminist women would say as well. However, the scenes of her crying and being emotionless prove otherwise, it would seem, that in fact she is sad about her decision and says it to appear to be strong in some sense. It's contradictory to try and present a strong, independent, working woman as in reality someone lonely who is just around to hook up with other people for her job. Not only that, but the two women are seemingly pitted against each other to win the heart of Zeffirelli, pushing his story forward. The story tells the tale of Roebuck Wright and the night he ate dinner with the commissioner. That night, Gigi, the son of the commissioner, is kidnapped and the whole thing is thrown into a frenzy. The story contains two women, one of the two who works with the commissioner. She is older and largely unimportant. The other is showgirl number one, a nameless- I'm Gigi, by the way. What's your name? I'm not gonna tell you that. This is a felony. Scantily clad, careless prostitute with a touch of rebellion. While I believe I can speak for all of us when I say that kidnapping is wrong, it could be seen as a minuscule success for the women of Wes Anderson films everywhere that a woman gets to be on the side of the villain. That's where the power is, where the intrigue is. However, our beloved showgirl actually speaks kindly to Gigi. Hello. Sings a lullaby for him. And feeds him. Still powerful and feminine actions displayed by a woman, but they're actions that are always left for no man would sing to a child they just kidnapped. Wes Anderson juxtaposes the scandalous nature of her work with an affectionate side, and while it seems to be a feminist move, it is inherently degrading. Anderson anticipated audiences would assume the stereotype that a prostitute could never be so caring, and thus choose to make the woman with a warm personality a showgirl. But it only furthers the stereotypical sexualized woman trope. As Pennell and Ben Morowitz stated, the extraordinary woman's heroic effect is muddied with every step taken to sexualize her. Anyway, I hope showgirl number one is doing alright. You're not a criminal, you're just a mixed up showgirl. Ha. In conclusion, Wes Anderson makes beautiful films that deserve the respect that they receive, but that does not mean that he does not need to grow and progress in his work. Anderson's films are a fine example of all the points that Mobley was originally trying to make. There are no feminist heroes to be found in Wes Anderson's world, but this is likely due to larger societal flaws rather than Anderson having his own misogynistic agenda.